people of Earth. Welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. So you'll all be familiar with the tripartite schema of Byzantine history into uh, early, middle, and late Byzantine history. You know, Byzantine things generally come in three parts. Now, the middle and late periods are pretty self-explanatory, but early Byzantine history seems to have dropped off the radar. I mean, nobody refers to it really that way. And part of the problem is that it overlaps with so many other periodizations and categorizations. Uh, So, for example, it overlaps with late Roman and early medieval and early Christian and especially late antique. So, the period of late antiquity as a field in itself sort of ballooned for a while and it expanded to include, well, it's got no firm dates or anything, but, you know, roughly between the 3rd and the 7th centuries. Um, Some would contract that a little bit. Some might expand it considerably more. Uh, But it has become a field in its own right, Um, kind of leaving Byzantium with just the middle and late period. Now, there's a really curious tension that is built into the very concept of late antiquity and its practice as a field. So on the one hand, as its name reveals, it is presented as the end of something. It's late antiquity. So you kind of come at it from antiquity and you're seeing the final stages of antiquity. Um, and, And this tends to actually correspond to the Uh, expertise and training of most people who work on late antiquity. They are far more likely to know uh, better materials that are in earlier Roman history or even Hellenistic or ancient history than to be experts on, you know, like the schism of the churches in the 11th and 12th centuries or the problem of the themes in middle Byzantine administration, things like that, right? So it's kind of a field that is positioned at the end of the study of antiquity. And yet at the same time, it's constituted as a field in order to push back against ideas of decline and fall and end. And it's all about the creation of new things, right, from monasticism and the Christian church as a sort of an established institution and all these new writings of literature and uh, hagiography and, you know, religious communities and so forth. And so it's kind of really looking toward the creation of the monotheistic Middle Ages with, you know, uh, hegemonic Christianity and Islam and Judaism and things like that. And this was a real tension in the field. Uh, It was far fewer scholars who worked on late antiquity who worked on the end of things, Uh, Though we now have very good books about the end of ancient athletics, the end of ancient paganism, the end of ancient philosophy, for sure. But the dominant trend in late antiquity was the rise of this and the rise of that and so forth. Now, just to be clear, all periods are periods when some things are ending and some things are beginning. And so in a certain sense, it's kind of arbitrary or it's defined by the way in which we select our topics, our themes for research, whether we look at our periods as uh, beginning or end of whatever it is that we're working on. So I will admit that in writing a history of Byzantium, which I've been doing for some years now, I have to treat this period as a period of beginnings. And there are some very real beginnings for me there. For example, the foundation of the city of Constantinople, the establishment of the imperial Christian church, the creation of the big government of Diocletian and Constantine, you know, that that tax system, that set uh, army structure, and so forth. So these things for me all look to the future. They look more toward what we call Byzantium later on. My guest today emphatically sees late antiquity as the end of antiquity. She is Polymnia Athanasiadi, a scholar I have known and respected for many years, decades actually. Um, Some of you might know her uh, for her book on Julian, uh, which uh, was her first book a long time ago, um, and and she's written 
a more recent version of that book in Greek, which somewhat changes the, how Julian is positioned in history for her. Polymne is also a bit of a maverick uh, who questions how fields are sometimes set up and defined. Um, and she, she's written some very stimulating, provocative um, e essays uh, along these lines about late antiquity. And she's currently working on a project that focusing on cities and the life of ancient sh cities will treat uh, late antiquity as the final period of the ancient city. And there's a lot of truth, obviously, to that kind of approach. When it comes to East Roman civic life and urban life, things come to a pretty crashing end in the 7th century, and towns have to be reconstituted in a completely different way after that. So I wanted to talk to her about exactly how she sees late antiquity as the end of a very long period that I think she would date uh, from like Alexander the Great on. So there's this millennium from Alexander to Muhammad that she thinks of as a unit, a sort of civilizational historical unit that needs to be studied um, in its uh, own right, right? And so my civilizational unit, which is like that around Constantinople, overlaps with hers for those 300 years. But my millennium, as it were, is from Constantine to Mehmet the Conqueror. So that inevitably imposes a different perspective. Okay, one more concept that I want to throw out there. Um, so Polymnia, extremely versatile scholar, has written in Greek and in English and in French. Um, and one of her more sort of provocative, stimulating uh, French books, uh, it's kind of like a long essay, is um, on a um, concept called Pensée Unique, in which she introduces and talks about uh, another sort of Greek calc concept, the monodoxy, right? So like you have orthodoxy, you have monodoxy. And this is the idea that there can be only one true faith, right? That only one theological system is correct and all the others are not only just um, intellectually wrong, but pernicious and you know, instruments of Satan and so on. And they need to be repressed in various ways. And so part of her thinking has been, how did that come about? Uh, uh, it, it, you know, during antiquity and late antiquity, how do we get to a point where emperors are deciding, you know, what the, the one true religion for their subjects is going to be and how this plays out in, in intellectual life and in social life and, and in, in writings and so forth. And what is fascinating about her approach is that she doesn't, as some of you might expect, focus the attention of this theme on emerging imperial Christianity only, but she traces how this kind of thinking was also operative in different ways, but also on the pagan side. And and we find early traces of this kind of thinking in um, non-Christian emperors of the third century, but also in the kinds of theological disputes that were playing out among the Neoplatonists. Though this is a subject of a different book of hers, which is a topic for a different discussion. I mention this because I think monodoxy does come up at some point in our conversation, uh, which was recorded during this past summer. So we're about six months away uh, from it at this point. But I made a note that I should tell you what monodoxy is in the introduction here. So I have done so. All right, let's get to this. Uh, many thanks to Medievalist.net for reposting these podcasts. Hello, Medievalists out there. So here then is my conversation with Polymnia. So I am sitting in what is probably the most gorgeous study I have ever been in. <laughs> so picture a room that's about, I don't know, five meters by four meters. It's on the second floor of a house on a hill overlooking the port of Edina. Uh, so we can we have a wonderful view of the, of the town and the port in the distance. Uh, in between there are cypress trees and olive trees and pine trees um, and the sea. And of course, across the sea, we can see the Peloponnese on one side yes. and Attica on the other side of the room. So three fourths of the room um, has very large windows um, and the back wall has, of course, the books. 
Uh, so it's a really spectacular location. And um, thank you for inviting me here, Polymnia, and thank you for agreeing to be on the podcast. Well, thank you very much for coming here. Of course, you make everything sound much better than it really is, but I suppose you are quite used to this kind of policy. So, thank you and welcome to Egina. So, let's talk about late antiquity. This is a topic on which you have written a lot and with great insight, and I always sort of situate you as a sort of genius to the side of the field, and, you know, in terms of shaking assumptions um, and providing new models for looking at late antiquity. Uh, so let's talk about the field in in general uh, to begin with. And in particular, um, you have commented on the the way in which the field of late antiquity in recent decades has talked about the developments of that period as you know, in terms of creativity and the rise of this or that and new beginnings and sort of very fertile cultural environment. And, you know, so it's marked by words like making and the rise and the emergence and things like this. And of course, that model was supposed to push against the old model of decline and fall. It's understandable. Um, and it postulates a series of new beginnings. So that's where we get the Middle Ages eventually and later the you know, Islam and, and, and Europe as, you know, uh, as Europe <laughs> imagines itself. So let's talk a little bit about that model. And could you start by telling us what late antiquity is in terms of where and when? And then we'll try to hook it up into periods before and after. Okay. Now, to go by its title, one would surmise that late antiquity is not an independent period. It sounds like the tale of antiquity. It is a period pregnant with the idea of the end. Yet, is this the case? The first question is when and why the concept of late antiquity came into being. Now, as a historiographical paradigm, late antiquity was born sometime in the 1970s, I would say, out of a double dissatisfaction. On the one hand, it was conceived as a reaction to the rather brutal tripartite scheme, antiquity, middle ages, modern times. And on the other, more importantly, as an assault on the old model of decline and fall. Though late antiquity is an eminently fluid, and I would say even protean concept, I will attempt to answer your question and provide a provisional geographical and chronological definition of it. Now, broadly speaking, late antiquity covers what the French historian Fernand Braudel has denoted as the greater Mediterranean, la plus grande Méditerranée, a huge and vague area which extends on three continents, embracing not just the lands which were ruled by Rome in the early centuries of our era, but also the other, with a capital O, the Persians and the Arabs, the Berbers of the south, the barbarians of the north. In other words, all those states and ethnicities who, in the face of Roman imperialism, asserted their identity, or sacrifice their difference. Now, let's go for chronology. In 1971, Peter Brown, who is certainly at the, on, at the origin of the present debate, and certainly its most famous exponent, brought out a little book entitled The World of Late Antiquity, from Marx Aurelius to Mohammed. Then he revised this chronology, this span of five centuries, and in a collective work which sets the norms for the period and which was published around about 99 or 2000, uh, he included in his scheme not just Charlemagne as he had done before, but also Harun al-Rashid, the Abbasids, and the Baghdad. Now all sorts of variations on this open cultural and chronological model have been proposed, but the general trend is that of expansion rather than contraction. Indeed, some late antiquities reach as far as the year 1000. And in this connection, it is important 
to remember that there are many late antiquities, each one with its own distinct beginning and end. Their shape and their length depends on the themes treated and on the methodologies used for their treatment. Now let me talk a bit about my own late antiquity, which centers around society and its physical milieu, culture and religion. Well, this late antiquity of mine is as long as any. In fact, it covers a full millennium. But contrary to the general tendency, my thousand years regress. The starting point of my periodization coincides with the birth of the Hellenistic world and its end with the rise of Islam. So you have there a thousand years. And let me say that uh, Alexander and Muhammad appear as the guardians of this organic unity uh, that I, more often than not, uh, call the Greco-Roman millennium or, sometimes, the long Hellenistic age. Broadly speaking, we're talking about 300 BC to 700 AD. Now, you might wonder why I include in my scheme what is normally described as the Hellenistic age. Well, I do this only because uh, without this background, late antiquity is simply incomprehensible. All the main trends, all the important themes which lend late antiquity its specific character, which shape its social and cultural profile, have their origin in the Hellenistic world. And it is within Hellenistic boundaries that mutation, the seeds of mutation, as it were, were so, I'm thinking specifically about the emergence of a number of philosophical systems and of their increasing theological relevance, or, or even religious relevance. The heritage of Plato is a case in point. Let me be more specific about the crucial importance of the Hellenistic age in my scheme. The world which came into existence as a result of Alexander's conquest was a global world and it was called the oikumeni, a Greek term meaning the inhabited and by extension the civilized world. Communication in this globalized environment was conducted through a universal linguistic instrument, like today we speak in English. So the so-called koini, meaning common language, which was simplif a simplified version of the Attic dialect, uh, was uh, the instrument that everybody used uh, for uh, everyday communication. In this idiom, and this is very important, we should remember that the Gospels and the rest of the texts of the New Testament were written. So this one example of its universal currency. Another phenomenon with long-reaching consequences is the coming together in fact, the merging of traditions and mentalities from East and West. It is in the Hellenistic world that new philosophical trends were born and the theological discourse was articulated, which would eventually dominate the Byzantine and other medieval cultures. So, this is important. Let's now say something about the political framework of this world and of its ascendancy on people's imaginaire. From day one, the predominant regime in the Hellenistic world was monarchy. This eventually mutated into the increasingly absolute model that we find in Rome and Byzantium. Now, monarchy suggested the idea of a unique, all-powerful god. Well, we all know that everywhere and at all times, men shape their heaven in the likeness of the earth they inhabit. In this connection, we should not disregard the fact that a variety of monotheistic creeds had emerged long before Yeshua of Nazareth presented to his disciples his own view of the religious tradition into which he had been born. Of course, Jesus spoke in Aramaic, but his message was shaped by his Hellenistic milieu. And, I should add, no one else did as much in order to bring out the Hellenistic relevance of this message 
as the fully Hellenized Jew that was Paul of Tarsus. Now, Jesus and Paul of Tarsus, the second much more than the first, are products of this world, the Hellenistic world. This is why I include the Hellenistic world in, in my scheme. Because without it, as I said at the beginning, late antiquity is lame, incomprehensible, lacks a head, lacks my, a mind, as it were. Yeah, so just to be clear, so a number of scholars see in late antiquity the beginning of trends that would dominate for the next millennium. So schematically, just for the sake of conversation, let's say that I, as a Byzantinist, would begin a history of Byzantium, as I have in the fourth century, <laughs> right? where all of a sudden you have a number of developments, the foundation of Constantinople, the establishment of Christianity as official, um, and later the only permitted religion, you have monasticism, and mm -hmm. so forth. So all of these things sort of come together and bespeak a new beginning. Um, and later Byzantines even look back at to Constantine and precisely this period as a new re-foundation yes. right, of, of, of the world um, that had preceded it. And so what you're suggesting is a different orientation where we, we slide the ruler back and late antiquity and you know returns to being the end of something, of developments that you just uh, mm -hmm. outlined in, in politics and religion and thought, right? Where you trace the beginning in the Hellenistic period and through the Roman period, so you absorb mm -hmm. the period of the Roman Empire, right, into a broader Hellenistic scheme, right, if, if, if I understand correctly. Yes. I mean, I obviously see advantages to both of those models. As you said exactly, it depends on what kinds of themes and histories mm -hmm. you're, you're planning to tell, right? And so when you look at, for example, Platonism, it makes sense to use your scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you look at uh, something like Epicureanism, for example, that seems to peter out before the period mm -hmm. of late antiquity. Maybe, maybe not. Anyway, um, it's just not much of a concern when you reach the 4th century. So the point is that the, the scholarship has tended to focus more on the new, the emergence of new trends in the fourth century, and it tends to drop the thread of things that had been developing before. So if that's what you're saying, I, I, I agree with you. So yes. if you read a lot of scholarship on, say, the second century mm -hmm. by people who work on, I don't know, the second sophistic or whatever, mm -hmm. and then you look at scholarship on late antiquity in the fourth century, it's very difficult to connect those two bodies of scholarship because yes. they're working on different kinds of themes. Yes. Because, oh, there's a boat. Yes. Coming or going. Uh, so one of the threads that you've used to connect them again, right, is Hellenism. Yes. And this is in the title of your, the collection of your articles, The Mutations of Hellenism. And so Hellenism is obviously a term with so many different meanings in this period and, and most periods uh, from, you know, ranges from religious to cultural and linguistic and philosophical and ethnic and so forth. Uh, so why don't I just ask you, what, how do you understand Hellenism and how does it function for you as a thread to connect this long Hellenistic period? Okay. Well, I put my emphasis on continuity in general, but just a small thing. You talked about Epicureanism and you said that Epicureanism pits out uh, at some point before the 4th century. Well, Epicureanism becomes the devil, is uh, demonized both by the Platonists and by the Christians uh, and by the Jews, uh, and uh, they go on and on and on against Epicureanism, and one has the impression that uh, it is uh, very much an alive current and a live thing throughout late antiquity. Otherwise, why should uh, people denounce it uh, with such fury? You're right. It reminds me a little bit of what the Byzantines did to Julian. Right? Yeah, well, right. well, well, we'll come to that. <laughs> yeah. But let me for the moment uh, okay, but say something about uh, Hellenism, uh, which is you know, a trend uh, that uh, characteristic of all of this long period. Well, uh, Hellenism is a new coinage, huh? it's, a, it's a neologism huh? in, the Hellenistic, in Hellenistic times. Well, I have already said that as a result of Alexander's conquest, 
Greek replaced Aramaic as the lingua franca of the greater Eastern Mediterranean. This means that a set of rules had to be put down, had to be formulated for the correct usage of this common linguistic tool. And the term Hellenism, Hellenismos, was then invented to describe this set of rules and guide the user. To speak and write a Greek free of barbarisms and solecisms, that is to handle discourse without grammatical and syntactical mistakes, was the mark of Hellenism. So this is a usage right at the beginning, right at the dawn of the Hellenistic period. But the new construct overflowed, as it were, its linguistic boundaries. Soon, Hellenismos came to mean many other things, and especially the set of customs and values which characterized the Greek way of life and the Greek way of thinking also. Now, traditional Jews, and this is important, uh, viewed Greek culture in competitive terms. Thus, for them, and I'm referring to the Second Maccabees, Hellenism implied the compromise or even the loss by a Jew of his ethnic and religious identity through the voluntary adoption of the Greek way of life. This specific usage points to a more general trend in a world in which the traditional antithesis between Greek and barbarian, I mean, this is what uh, was the main antithesis, the great antithesis in classical times. Now, this antithesis in Hellenistic times ceases to operate on racial grounds and adopts culture as its criterion of differentiation. And this is due to Hellenism. This is the point when we have to remember that the education dispensed throughout the Hellenistic world by the gymnasium was not static. Though it's something that starts right at the beginning of Hellenistic times. Hellenistic education, paideia, was a dynamic and ever-evolving and ever-changing force uh, open to the varied traditions of the Orient. And it was through the channels of this paideia that next to a linguistic koine, a multiform philosophical koine, was given wide currency in the greater Mediterranean throughout Hellenistic times until in the second century AD, Hellenismos, Hellenism, was singled out by the Christian apologists as a dangerous rival to their own revelatory creed. They recognized in Hellenism a religion, not just a full thought world. What is interesting is that it is the Christian polemic that gave the term Hellenism this meaning of religious discourse and practice. Hellenism became a, synonymous, a synonym for paganism. And it is important to remember that in Byzantium, Hellenism was the everyday word, as well as the legal term, to denote paganism and idolatry. Now, let's see how the, the notion, this notion evolves. The Emperor Julian, I'm coming to the Emperor Julian, who was aware of the negative connotations attached to Hellenismos by the Christians. Now, this man, who was a clever man, and an educated man, he was steeped in Neoplatonic philosophy, turned Hellenism on its head and used the term to describe his own political, social, intellectual, educational, and religious program. In Julian's hands, Hellenism became a holistic weapon. Now, we're in the mid-4th century AD. And it is interesting, and I would say quite amusing to note, that in order to attack him, his enemies reverted to the original meaning of Hellenism as the correct usage of Greek. I think that what precipitated this archaic usage was Julian's all-inclusive understanding of Hellenism as expressed, uh, for one thing, in his famous Law on Education. By this law, which is a manifesto on the unity of Greek culture, I would say, 
Julian prohibited the teaching of the classics by men who did not believe in the essential values espoused by the authors on whose works uh, they themselves commented. There are many examples, for instance, in an invective uh, uh, that Gregory of Nazianzos uh, conveniently composed after Julian's, Julian's death. Uh, he angrily asks him, is Hellenism, is Atticism your own personal chattel? Like the rest of his co-religionists, Gregory pretends to ignore the semantic development, the huge semantic development that the term Hellenismos had undergone in no less than eight centuries. And it is with this Hellenismos of the Hellenistic and the imperial, the early imperial times, uh, that I deal uh, in a lot of my publications. So it seems that in some respects, what's happening in late antiquity is that earlier mutations yes. um, or you know cultural phenomena be they epicureanism or um, hellenism are being recast as negatives uh, by whichever group has an interest in doing so exactly and that they're defining their own identities and programs uh, in relation to this redefined mm -hmm. you, know, you know bad version of earlier hellenistic concepts at the same time when you have someone like Julian who is proposing Hellenism as a all-embracing cultural model, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so a, a kind of identity that's equivalent to that which the Christian fathers were trying to construct for their own religion. Mm -hmm. They react against that by pulling out an yes. earlier version of exactly. Hellenism. <laughs> exactly. Right? That's much more narrower yes. that they can appropriate yes. because they can do good Greek prose as yes. well as he exactly. can, right? And so this, I think, the term mutations wonderfully captures this kind of dynamic mm -hmm. where you have older and more recent models of the same things sort of jostling for in, in competition. Uh, you've also described this period um, as one where earlier, what you've called anthropocentric models of culture give way to more theocratic uh, or theocentric yes. versions of culture. And theocratic. And theoretically, obviously, this is a very you know big question. We you know we can't explore all aspects of it now. But could you give some examples yeah. of how you see this playing out? Well, this is period? not the easiest of things, no. uh, and uh, as you very well know, this scheme of mine is controversial, and most people don't like it because we are dealing with a lingering and complex process, a process which is riddled with inconsistencies, ambiguities, uh, comes back uh, to diversations. But despite everything, it is a process that we can put our finger on. It's an evolution which, to my mind at least, gathers momentum as from the 4th century. What is clear to everybody is by the 6th century, this society, is going in a certain direction, and the spread of Islam in the 7th century seems to me to confirm this intuition, this view of mine. Now, you would like me to illustrate uh, what I mean by this evolution, by this mutation from an anthropocentric to a theocentric culture, by giving you an example. Well, I suppose I can take an example from the physical and social environment of late antique life. Let's take a stroll in the Hellenistic city, the polis. The polis is a term which is very important and uh, it's a term from which we derive words and notions like polity, politic, politician. Uh, so from now onwards, uh, when talking of the ancient city, I will be referring to it as the polis. Well, we will find that in the Hellenistic world, the self-governed polis was not swallowed uh, by the mechanisms of the monarchical regimes, uh, uh, which were immediately established by the successors of Alexander. On the contrary, the polis thrived, and this Hellenistic blooming of urban life has been described as the second rise of the polis. New cities sprang up all over Asia. 
Now, what kind of cities were they? These cities were designed according to the octagonal urbanistic grid system. A system which was codified, it seems rather invented, by the 5th century Milesian urbanist Hippodamus. These cities, with their educational and cultural institutions, the gymnasium, the philosophical school, the library, the theatre, the stadium, spread the social and educational values of Hellenism as far as India and Afghanistan. Yet it was not before the coming of Rome on the international scene that the Hippodamian, let's call it, city, was to encounter its hour of real glory and of global glory. It was then, and thanks to the Romans, that the architectural and educational ethos of the Hellenistic city, with its public space devoted to culture and entertainment, is very important, spread, this kind of city, spread to remote parts of Northern Europe, and even to the very edge of the Sahara. Let me give you an example. The remains of a Roman military station in today's Algeria, Timgad, offer a good example of what I'm talking about. This Roman colony, which was founded by Trajan, and if I remember right, around about 100 AD, so this Roman colony had a theatre, a fantastic library, marketplaces and luxurious baths, many luxurious baths. And that was on the Sahara. The life of culture at leisure and fun propagated by the various institutions of the polis reached, I would say, a climax in the Antonine and the Severan age, that is, in the second and early third century AD. We're dealing with a way of life devoted to the systematic cultivation of the human body and mind and to the pleasures that can be derived therefrom. And this is what I call the triumph of an anthropocentric mentality, of an anthropocentric model. It's a hymn to man's physical and intellectual abilities. Of course, there is the andilogos, the contradiction to it. Already in its hour of glory, this model did not go without criticism, and criticism from within. But criticism, we should remember, is evidence of the freedom of thought and diversity of a truly pluralistic society, an anthropocentric society. What characterizes the Greco-Roman polis of the three centuries preceding and the three centuries following our era is its joie de vivre and a high part intellectual activity. Dynamism and creativity are the words that come to mind if one wants to describe the atmosphere of the Greco-Roman polis. Let's try then and imagine everyday life within the walls of such a polis. The principal feature of its physical typology was order, exemplified, I would say, in the colonnaded streets, which stretched for hundreds of meters, sometimes for miles. But it's not just a thing of beauty, this colonnaded street. I mean, one should look at the reconstructed Cardo Maximus in Apamia, which stretches for two miles. The majestic avenues of the Roman cities should also be seen as the symbol of a way of life steeped in leisure and in sociability. We are dealing with a basically outdoor existence spent in the marketplace, in the theatre, the amphitheatre eventually, and of course the gymnasium, the palestra, and the baths. Relaxation and discussion are the hallmarks of this existence. And in those baths where people spend the whole day, as sometimes they do today in uh, autumn, in, well, in, uh, in Turkey, in Turkish baths, uh, I spent a full day there once, uh, 
So these baths were decorated with mosaics representing the amenities of a life given to pleasure. So sport and discussion are the hallmarks of that anthropocentric culture. We shouldn't, of course, forget the athletic games and the rhetorical competitions which were associated with the many religious festivals of the ancient world. And uh, the stage, the theatre for them, was the polis, every single polis of the Roman world. Now, all that went very well until sometime in the 3rd century, uh, when the so-called crisis of the 3rd century dealt a blow on all this. It was not just the financial crisis, I would say, which was caused by succession of wars and invasions. It was not just that that affected everyday life. The moral outlook was also changing. The turning inwards and the quest of what people would call uh, for the angelic life are phenomena illustrated by a number of philosophies theosophies and religions, which gathered momentum in the last century before our era and reached the climax of popularity in the second century AD, ironically, as the anthropocentric model, exemplified by the Antonine city, was reaching its peak. The era was dubbed, in a famous book, An Age of Anxiety. It's a little book based on lectures that Ian Dodds gave in the 60s, in the 1960s. The answer to the era of anxiety uh, came from Peter Brown, who characterized the centuries uh, that succeeded the Antonine miracle as an age of ambition. The one, of course, does not ex exclude the other. What do you think? Whatever I see ambition around me, especially in administration and management and so oh, on, I see okay. a great deal of okay. anxiety. You, you are less lucky than I am. Uh, the progress of Christianity, along with that of other spiritual movements, is to my mind symptomatic of both tendencies, anxiety and ambition. People who are dissatisfied with their world, they wanted to change it. And change, of course is a mark of dynamism and of new beginnings. Uh, I refer to the 4th century as a period of acceleration of the process of mutation. To the gradual, but I would say unremitting, desecularization of the city, corresponds in the 4th century a twin movement, a twin phenomenon, the rise of the desert, as, a, as an alternative living space. The Desert a City is the title of a famous book by Derwes Chitty, which appeared in the 1960s. Within a few decades this, of the 4th century, the steppes and the wildernesses of Egypt, Palestine and Syria became peopled by monks and by hermits. Monasticism and Hermeticism became the new force that attracted people of all conditions, and like a magnet. And eventually, the sites that had been sanctified by the presence of holy men gave birth to remarkable monuments. One example, famous example, is Kalat Siman, in today's northern Syria, where Simon the Stylite, an absolute celebrity, to his contemporaries, gave his performance for the millions who visited him from East and West. Well, by the 5th century, the hovels of the recluse and the columns where the stylites ostentatiously, I would say, led their angelic lives, had become busy centers of pilgrimage and commerce. The true philosophers of the Greco-Roman Oikumeni, as they called themselves, as the uh, monks called themselves, administered their spiritual charisma in the form of healing miracles, prophecies to humanity, 
to people who never stop congregating there, avid for grace. But they also, I mean, but the, these uh, monks and hermits quite frequently left their holy abode and traveled as far as the great city to do what? To castigate sin and heresy and advise the powerful. As Peter Brown has shown in a well-known article, which came out at the same time as his little book on the world of late antiquity, the interaction of these holy men with the urban and rural populations was constant, and their authority spread far and wide, and of course reached the court. Well, this is the time when, as a result of the spreading of, I would say, new ideologies, the urban scene and its functions were irreversibly changing. This is what I call the desecularization of the polis. The public area of most cities was allowed to go to pieces. I'm talking about, it's a phenomenon beginning in the 5th century. Scythopolis, for instance, Bethsheen in Palestine, offers a good example of this process. Apamia in Syria offers another. Shops and houses were encroaching on public space. The colonnaded streets and the public squares with their elegant fountains were now invaded by all sorts of immigrants. And soon, a new urban layout of winding little lanes and streets and covered markets began to emerge in their place. At the same time, the church was usurping the social functions, what, of the theatre, and of course of the bathhouse. The bathhouse in particular, with its array of statues and beautiful mosaics, was seen as the abode of demons. Probably in this connection, I should mention the demonization of irises a word whose semantic evolution, semantic development, illustrates extremely well this passage from an anthropocentric to a theocentric mentality. Iresis means choice and election. Now, in Hellenistic times, it acquired a more narrow meaning, the meaning of philosophical school and of the principles professed by its adepts. I mean, to be a Stoic, an Epicurean or a Cynic was then a conscious choice of life, an irises, which gave you your identity in the middle of a very diverse world. So, in Hellenistic times, the meaning of irises narrowed I mean, from general choice and from election, it came to mean a choice of life according to particular principles, but at the same time, by the same token, it becomes the sign of the individual spiritual freedom in an open society. And in the even more open society of imperial Rome, the irises were multiplied. <laughs> Indeed, when Christianity appeared, it was designated as the Judaic irises of the Nazarenes. But as Christianity spread, its reception naturally varied. People understood it in different ways. And soon it was felt by the members, members of the church hierarchy that the many diverse ways of understanding the Christian message had to be controlled. The semantic lapse from choice to heresy is indicative of this changing ethos, of the changing ethos of late antiquity. In the later Roman Empire, the heretic was seen not just by the church, but by the state as well, as the criminal, and as from the 4th century, he was punished by exile and death. And we know that uh, later on in the West, at least, and he was punished by the pyre, by, by being burnt alive. 
Now, shall we go back to the late antique city, this beautiful city which punishes the heretics? One of the most important changes that took place at that time is the means of transport. Wheeled vehicles were replaced by pack animals, a development that led to the gradual disappearance of the colonnaded street, uh, which, as we just said, uh, was the very, very symbol of the polis. By the 6th century, the great colonnade of Apamia, for example, uh, which measured a, a width of uh, 35 meters in places, was blocked by rubble, and with the increasing use of beasts of burden, a road width of no more than three and a half meters was more than sufficient. So in this new landscape of hovels, of uh, rubble, of uh, tortuous lanes, the only monumental buildings were the houses of God and the palaces of the civil and ecclesiastical elites. And it is this changed city with its parasitic urbanism, I would say, that the Muslims inherited from the Byzantines. In an important article, which he entitled From Polis to Medina, Hugh Kennedy saw the transformation of the late antique city as a long-term, a protracted process, which was not completed before the 10th century. Wolf Liebeschutz, in a recent book, famously entitled Decline and Fall of the Roman City, places urban decay in the East no later than the 7th century. I'm afraid I agree with Liebeschutz. Now, what are the causes for the demise of the city? Well, in the course of this metamorphosis, many are the factors that played their part. One of them was catastrophic earthquakes, which as from the 5th century kept recurring. The outbreaks of plague, the recurrent Persian invasions that afflicted the eastern provinces of the empire in the 6th century, all that, I would call those, all those, the external or accidental factors of the demise of the polis. Others, for instance, the persistent discourse on the vanity of human existence, the flight of the local elites from the polis to the imperial administration, the desert and the ranks of the church, are to my mind the endogenous causes which signify a change in mentality, the coming of, the, of what I call the theocentric mentality. The real change that occurred over the course of the Greco-Roman millennium was not, I would say, the transition from paganism to Christianity, as people never stop repeating. The transition from paganism to Christianity and Islam, no. It's not that. It's an overall mutation which affected all aspects of the way of thinking, feeling, and living in the greater Mediterranean, and which I may sum up as the substitution of an anthropocentric by theocentric cultural model. So, I hope that I answered your question, how this mutation happens, how it occurs. I hope. It's not a very easy thing. It no. Wasn't, it wasn't a very easy thing. Are, are you satisfied with my answer? Um, let me put it in a bit of a context for the benefit of the audience, just so that they're clear about what you're saying and what you're not saying. <laughs> there is a model that we've inherited from oh, roughly the time of the Enlightenment, which is that classical, rational Greco-Roman antiquity yes. was somehow undermined by Christianity, promoting irrationality and theocentrism and so forth. And that tradition has still, it has many exponents. Many yes. people believe this, right? That, that, that Christianity was this sort of cultural stab in the back uh, to a classical culture that they, they still admire, which is rooted in many modern you know, uh, institutions and, and value systems. 
And this is not what you're saying. No. No. Let's be clear I do about not this. qualify theocentrism as a negative thing. Right. I'm just. Beyond that, it's not just the Christians who were part of this mutation. Certainly temptation. not. Right. And, the, and the Neoplatonists were far more so orthodoxy and heresy yeah. in the Christian sense. Uh, uh, were terribly important to the Neoplatonists. They were the ruling principles. Right. And as they went on, uh, more and more. And Julian, of course, is... Yeah, and, you, and you've written an that. entire book on how these same issues, uh, which <clears throat> you know, most of the audience will think was endemic or limited even to early Christianity, in fact, played out in the otherwise mm -hmm. pagan circles of the Neo late Neoplatonists, and you've also written about this in connection with Julian. But Julian, who is often put up as a kind of, um, you know, last stand against Christianity, huh. you've actually depicted as someone who is very much um, part of the same general transformation of culture. He's just doing it in, you know, his own religious tradition rather than that of the Christians, but it's the same sort of thing. Um, and that's fine. So let me push back a little bit on the transformation of the city. Yes. And uh, while not denying any of the cultural changes that you described, those certainly occurred, it seems to me that a great deal of the transformation in the city, especially its sort of infrastructure, was linked to administrative and fiscal developments that have to do with of the course. Roman state, that, that by themselves had nothing to do, I think, with the cultural transformations for you know, reasons we don't need to get into here, but I think that the state in the late third and century onward was trying to squeeze a lot more resources out of its territories. So the administration of taxation was reorganized, it was rationalized, there was a budget. And the local elites, especially city elites, mm -hmm. that had previously been given the right to allocate the tax distribution locally yes. at their discretion, now found themselves without that discretion, I think having to pay their fair share of taxes, which they yeah. had not done before, on the one hand. On the other hand, civic resources were confiscated to a considerable degree, uh, not entirely, and used for imperial purposes. And these local elites were then... All, and, and here's where I disagree with Liebeschwitz and, and the whole tradition of writing about, quote, the flight of the elites... Yeah. Like, I don't think this is what happened. What happened is that the imperial administration expanded enormously. It centralized it, a lot of its administration, and it offered the opportunity to local elites to expand their ambitions, right, to leave their cities and go join the imperial mm -hmm. administration. I mean, this isn't so much flight as it is, of, you know, promotion and, you know, mm. moving on and so forth. And anyway... We have instances uh, of decarians, uh, who decide who be, who become slaves in order to get rid of uh, you know the burdens uh, of uh, their right, of right. okay no no you so, know they you know they fly to the desert they uh, there is a flight of the Carians. if you read Libanius if you read uh, your friend John Lydus you can see that uh, people you know there is this oh, flight there's no doubt and that there it is happened. this and this death of the city, the elites of the city, the you know the great people who were uh, you know the rhetoricians, the who were at the same time the decarians, let's say who uh, who were the administrators of the city, are completely a hit, and they have to go. Oh, they are, they are. So, so let me just wrap up the so the argument. It, it sort of looks as follows. The city takes a big financial hit because of the way that the yes. empire is extracting yes. resources. And it all, the empire also extracts the local elites for its own purposes. Yes. So what that leaves behind is a poorer, smaller set of people who now don't find you know, their local Or the same activities. people who become impoverished. I, exactly. Right? I mean, most of the time yeah. it's the same people who don't manage to leave. Yeah, exactly. They stay where they were and they are demoted, right. as it were, and, impoverished. And those are the ones that we see struggling to get yeah, by, right, exactly. in the sources yeah. and all of that. And, and into that sort of vacuum, when, like when there's no more money for a lot of the cultural activities mm -hmm. that was taking place, 
the, the into that cultural vacuum stepped, you know, the bishops and their, you know, yeah. constituencies and they took over, right? Of like, course. Yeah. It was more of a, I don't want to say accidental, but I think that the, the, the space for that kind of transformation was no. created by, no? They don't agree with you. I think that uh, this administrative centralization is symptomatic of the more general mutation and change. You have uh, the one God in heaven, the one emperor in, uh, in, on earth. Around that one God in heaven, there are the angels, the saints, all these people, uh, all this bureaucracy. And you have uh, the reflection of this bureaucracy on earth. It has to do with a new mentality, the mentality that you adore the one representative of the one God, and of course those who surround him. Okay. Of course, I'm not at all for the uh, you know I disagree completely uh, with the model, the 19th, the 18th century model, the Enlightenment model, and you know if you like uh, the Emperor Julian is the most typical man of his age. He was a practicing ascetic. He was an indefatigable preacher of morals and a very boring preacher of morals. And of course, he was a Byzantine basileus avant la lettre. Actually, can, can I interrupt here? So 26 years ago or so, I was interviewed at Dumbarton Oaks for a fellowship. Yes. And I remember one of the... So I had written my undergraduate thesis on Julian. I was trying to come to grips I with remember. what he was. And... I had been asked, I can't remember by whom, whether I thought Julian was a Byzantine emperor. Yes. And I, I said, well, he was a Greek speaker, <laughs> a, a Greek speaking Roman emperor who never visited Rome. Exactly. And had a very strong sense of his religious mission. Yes. So, yeah. Actually, he was the first person we know who was born in Constantinople. Of course. Yeah. Of and course. so I thought, yeah, so on those grounds that counts. Well, the first Byzantine emperor, emperor we know. No, the was. first person that we know of. Ah, oh, yes. Yeah. 31. 31, yeah. 331, yeah. yes. Anyway, so are you going to write us a history of this long Hellenistic period where you pull all these threads together? In fact, yes. This is what I'm engaged in at the moment, and I need very much your help. And the book on monodoxy that uh, you read is uh, a preheating, as it were. Oh, <laughs> okay. Well... I look forward to that. Um, I and mean, we're almost out of time. I will put some thoughts about monodoxy in the introduction, uh, just as a way of framing yes. um, you know, how, how you see the end point of this long transformation of the Hellenistic period. Um, and I, I, I really look forward, because I've just, been, I've just finished writing the history of late antiquity as a Byzantinist, so mm -hmm. I'm trying to reclaim it for early Byzantium a little <laughs> bit. You know, it's been taken away. You know, we've kind of... No, been... no, it's late antiquity now. There is no <laughs> early Byzantium. I know we've been left with a middle and late Byzantium, but yes, no early... Yes, yes. At so, least you were left with that. I, <laughs> I mean, Hellenistic historians uh, until are some... accu accusing me <laughs> that I did not leave anything for them. <laughs> okay, so until someone else comes along and takes away middle Byzantium from us, which I don't think is going to happen soon. But anyway... So I look forward to seeing um, late antiquity redescribed as sort of the late Hellenistic period. Thank you. And, and so am I actually, <laughs> and, this, and you can help me a lot. Okay. So by, by discussions like this. Okay. One. So we'll have another one when that project is further along. Yes. All right. So Volumia, thank you very much for being on the podcast. It's me who thanks you very much, and I thank you for having come all the way to Aegina, and now let's go and swim. Yes, swim and eat. Great. All right. Bye, everyone.